Yes, welcome. This is F a Rap Critic. I'm your boy Malik16. And no, I'm not a Southpaw, but today we are moving on your left and highlighting the man who gave us the line that birthed the name of this very show. Y'all know that we were not going to let this month pass without acknowledging the 30th anniversary of the debut album by Method Man. We're talking about none other than Takao. Wow, 30 years, y'all. I'm going to put the disclaimer out there now. I am biased when it comes to this album. This album has held me down. It's played a role in parts of my life. I know a lot of people have differing views about whether or not this album is a classic. But today, we're going to break down how it belongs in that conversation. This is category one, where we go over the album, the product itself. As you've seen me do with double albums before on the channel, I am leaving category two for a future date to be disclosed <laughs> and to be determined at some point because I'm putting it out there that I will have met the man on the show, on the channel before it's all said and done to break this down himself. I uh, definitely would want him to review his own lyrics. Shout out to Met The Man, one of my favorite rappers of all time. And um, yeah, if you have not already, take a moment to like and subscribe to the channel. Go visit the Rat Ruler. Man, if you've noticed, I am rocking the special gold foil embossed version of the I Used To Love Her shirt. I've been waiting for a reason to break this out. Couldn't think of any better reason in today's episode. You can go on to ratruler.com and cop that for yourself. Thank y'all for rocking with us. And uh, it only gets better. Let's jump into it. Little background on this album. It was released on November 15th of 1994 under the Def Jam recording label. This is the first official solo debut from the Wu-Tang Clan following their debut in the same month of November, a year prior. And... Um, it was highly anticipated based on the strength of the singles from that Wu-Tang album and, of course, the lead singles from this one. Let's jump into it. The first dimension we talk about in Category 1 is Dimension 1, the quality of the production. I'm sure most of you have heard the legendary story of RZA's studio basement getting flooded at his old house during the time immediately following the Into the 36 Chambers album and everybody getting ready to release their record solo. Uh, apparently, Inspector Deck was supposed to be the first one, and his caught the most damage. A lot of the beats on this album reportedly had to be recreated if they weren't just altogether lost. So Met The Man said that a lot of the album was pieced together. I think that becomes one of the, the bigger criticisms about the album. We'll talk about that in the next dimension, but it was being recorded in some weird places. It was being recorded in all different locales across the country, some parts of California, Texas, different studios that they weren't used to, different setups, like kind of those basic setups that most of us who, who rap have gone through when we're first starting out, where you're recorded in closets, uh, you got a sock over the microphone and a stocking cap instead of an official pop stopper, right? Um, man, those, those are those struggle and grind days. But he admits that a lot of the sound quality doesn't hold up to other Wu-Tang projects that were released throughout the 90s. The other aspect of what's going on here is that RZA is still in that grimy mode. Some of these beats were old and being recreated. Some of these beats are new. So you're getting different phases of who the RZA was, who the RZA is becoming, and also different phases of the Wu-Tang wave, right? This is the first wave of Wu-Tang. You can easily count the group's debut album Met The Man's album and Old Dirty Bastard's album as Wave 1, where Wu-Tang was thriving off of griminess. And Met The Man himself says, yeah, there were other players and other focuses by the time you get to Raekwon and Jizz's releases, which is why they have more cinematic quality to them. And here, Wu-Tang was living off of that esoteric, otherworldly, grimy grittiness, right? And so one word that could easily be used casually to describe the beats on this album are, no pun intended, dusty, right? Um, 
this was still in that <laughs> raw era of half of the members still being one foot in the streets, one foot out. The fame had came, but it's still nine members. Nobody's touching the true rewards and benefits of platinum success yet. And if you're understanding that some of these beats were old and being recreated, there's a murkiness. Distortion is just really all throughout. And you'll hear that in the way some of the, the bass lines vibrate, drums. So let's go through it. These are some of the elements that help make Wu-Tang and RZA himself famous and a go-to name in the industry for a long time because they were coming with a newness. There had been grimy sounds established, right? We're still talking about the boot camp click era, the Onyx era, but Wu-Tang were not afraid to play with earrings. The title track, Takao, is just this ominous kind of floaty, hazy introduction that doesn't have energy. And so it's really unorthodox in that day and age to start an album off like that, right? The beat drags, there's a rumble, it's kind of this dirty lo-fi intro. And if you bought it off the strength of what Method Man says used to be kind of what he was known for, the up-tempo, what he calls frantic type of style, it might seem like a little bait and switch, like what is this? But you've already been introduced to him, so you know that that's going to come. It's still an interesting choice because most record labels like to start off their albums with a high energy, catch your attention right away type of song. And that's not what's happening with Takao. There's no other song on the album that sounds like Takao that has that slowness unless we consider Sub Crazy. Sub Crazy, I remember seeing write-ups in the magazines about how this beat has no drums. It's just this thumping bass line and these weird sounds and sound effects of like bombs in the background crashing. Even the space where the samples believed to derive from for that song is unorthodox and it seemed very stripped down. Stripped down is another word that you could easily use for a lot of the beats on this album. So PLO style, which is supposed to be a sample of Al Green's Look What You Done For Me, is just a muffled stripping of the key elements of that song, right? The horns and the bass line. All you hear is that that's really all there is to that beat. Biscuits, which I've seen written as being uninteresting. It's crazy to me because that is my go-to song on this album is one of the weirdest takes on splicing, right? So the sample is from a song called Angel by James Clark and Brian Bennett. And you could tell Rizzo was kind of like dialing in the notes. And that's why it winds up having this phone call effect. It sounds like old school payphone. It's the way those notes were pitched and modulated in the sampler and how Rizzo decided to run with it. But the snare hits that he chooses to put behind it also add uh, a crispness to it. And it makes it this kind of unpredictable pattern of where are you going with this and method man is able to ride that somehow in an accordion style of rapping that makes him the final instrument on that beat and you know again that's a conversation i'd love to have with meth with how he pairs himself with the different sonics to to give it a fullness where the beats might be lacking another really stripped down basic song is the original version of All I Need. It really sounds like a Casio <laughs> interpretation of the Motown classic by Marvin Gaye and Tammy Terrell, just to build the main melody. And then this bass line, the sound effects in the background that kind of keep it going, it adds some continuity to the beat besides that bass line and the melody help it, but it still sounds like a demo of the versions of those songs that we've come to know. So by the time RZA makes the also oh famous version with Mary J. Blige, the Razor Sharp remix, it matches the emotions that Meth is trying to evoke when talking about relationship dynamics from his perspective, as opposed to what's going on here. You don't really get that captured. It's just words recited over that beat. Uh, and I don't think people appreciated the words that Method Man was saying until those remixes came out. Of course, we have to talk about the Diddy remix or back then the Puff Daddy remix, which is one of the few songs that is not disputed that he actually produced. And he, similar to the original version, what RZA did, follows the melody pattern of the you know, Motown classic, but adds that 
old school 80s. I want to say the Mona Lisa drum to it and the, the Biggie sample from me and my B. And it just gives it that bad boy effect with the synths in key parts. Shoot, I was listening to it today and I realized how key Puffy's version is to bringing out the love, the warmth of that song, why it became a summer jam, why it became a song that gets played to this day that women still gravitate to of all ages and know the words to, not only because the cheat code of sampling a Motown classic, but because right as Met The Man is building up to the, the points that he's making as each verse ends, the synths come in and then on parts when him and Mary J are saying really profound things, they do beat drops. I gotta love Jones right when that part, the beat drops. Or when she says, you are my destiny. Those key things that the original and the Razor Sharp remix are kind of missing that made it more of a radio darling. But the RZA version has more of a Jeep and club bang effect to it. So depending on where you go, you might hear one version more than the other. We know the RZA Razor Sharp version got the video. And if you grew up in New York in the 90s, the Puffy version was the one that, that ruled the airwaves most of the time. It goes into the conversation of the songs that are more robust and full in their sound. So stimulation is like a bridge between everything that I just named. It's in the same vein as the original All I Need to Get By because it has that unfinished quality. It samples the Sarah Vaughan song. It's a very jazzy sample called Snowbound, which is not the norm for a lot of the Wu-Tang beats at that time. It, it sounds prettier. What it has that makes it not so much of an outlier is that it's still an eerie sound when sped up. It's this whimsical, these violins, sounds like something out of a Disney movie, but when it's sped up and put with the drums and the other horn instruments that Riz is adding in there, then it's like, okay, this still sounds energetic and, and kind of frenetic with the horn and, and string placement. So it works and it's more of an up-tempo song, just like Release Your Delph. If you hear the original Herb Alpert sample, The Treasure of San Miguel, it's like the happiest sound in TV jazz instrumentation. And then you see what RZA did to it and added this griminess with the gunshots in the background and the hard drums and the hard bass line. And then I, I don't think Blue Raspberry ever stops singing in the background of that song. So she becomes a part of the soundscape on that track. So it's just high energy and there's horns on the low end and horns on the high end of Alicia Delph. Bring the pain. For this to be a beat that was older than the album itself, uh, Method Man said he had that while Into the Wu-Tang was being recorded. So if you imagine this is a beat for maybe the year 1992, the homie Beef puts it best when he talks about production that seems out of this world. Like what kind of drugs? What kind of drugs? Cause it's like, to think to put that Jerry Butler sample, I'm your mechanical man with the wah wah guitar and just the echoey bluesy feel of that with this constant hum. It, it almost feels like the way Timbaland describe building beats where he's beatboxing first or making a sound effect with his mouth and that becomes the main melody so everyone knows bring the pain for <laughs> and and that vocal sample mixed with the bluesy wah wah guitar but it's the drums and the keyboard hits the <laughs> like those decisions made this a classic song that feels high energy even though it's grimy and subdued, just like a lot of the other songs on the album. It just has an incessant kind of, it has a pace to it that makes you want to get up and do something. So those are the, the fuller songs on the album. Mr. Sandman and What the Blood Clot are the most typical sounding Wu-Tang songs on here. You expect those kind of melodic loops from a Wu-Tang song, especially, like I said, from this first wave. What the Blood Clot just being uh, three piano notes, boom, bloom, 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 with this booming bass line that's married with these claps, these drum claps. It makes sense. It's all you need. It's short enough to not get on your nerves. Same thing with Mr. Sandman. It's just that menacing bass line. But he keeps the bees humming in the background. <laughs> and then those guitar licks sampled 
in the back that just add a little more texture to it. That what kind of drugs? <laughs> what kind of drugs? So that's really a snapshot of all the production on the album. And it's something for you to consider on a scale from one to five heartbeats. That takes us to dimension two, the cohesiveness of the sonic bed. So I mentioned that Method Man said the album was pieced together. And I think a lot of detractors have said that that's why this album is not considered as great as the other Wu-Tang solo releases, because it just felt like it had no direction. It was just this dark lumbering album that had some bright moments and is better known for its remixes than its originals. But when we talk about this dimension, we're, we're really talking about sequencing at the heart of things, right? So it's a 13 track album. That's only if you're counting the Method Man remix at the end, which is a whole new song. So I guess you do count that. This is very rooted in break beats, bass lines, and sound effects. That's the kind of soundscape for this album. When thinking about where you would place songs differently to make it different, I think any configuration you come up with, you get the same outcome because so many of these songs have that same overall feel. Even if they're all different instruments, different tempos, the feel is there. So I could start the album with Sub Crazy or start it with Stimulation and end with Takao and still feel the same way. I, I don't know if it gets any better than putting You All I Need to Get By where it's at. It's the fourth song. It's one of the brighter songs, Release Your Delta and Stimulation comes at the end. Those are pretty much your brightest moments on the album. And if you didn't space them out like that, then it'd be like, okay, where are you taking me? And then dropping you off back to these dark spaces. Uh, even Meth versus Chef is a little uh, bright compared to the other. That's another one that is experimental, but also keeps some of that Wu-Tang feel because it's just some simple notes getting played back and forth. And speaking of tempos, they do a really decent job of giving you a slower song like Takao followed by a faster song like Biscuits, a slower song like What the Blood Clot followed by Meth vs. Chef. And if we're considering and taking into consideration how much tapes were the go-to medium of the day, right? CDs existed, but tapes still were the, the focal point as evidence a year later by Raekwon with the purple tape. Uh, the way this is set up, the first side ends with Sub Crazy, which you don't know where the album's going after that point, because that is a very, you know, eerie and weird song. And then it starts on the second side with the song on the album that sounds the most like an intro, which is Release Your Delph. With this acapella launch by Blue Raspberry, <laughs> out singing Gloria Gaynor on her own <laughs> take on her song, and then this triumphant sound letting you know side two is ready to go, side B. And when you think about that, there was some thought put into this. To make it gel better as an album, what would you do? Because you need that kind of flow of up and down to not make it seem any weirder than it already is or darker than it already is. Something to consider on a scale from one to five heartbeats. That takes us to dimension three, intentional mood and tone of the album. Metamist said that as he was recording this, no one knew what to expect from him. So he didn't feel the pressure that other members felt because we hadn't heard what a solo Wu-Tang release sounds like, unless you're going back prior to knowing that a Wu-Tang Clan was coming and thinking about releases by the Jizza and the Rizza. But really after the Into the 36 Chambers album, people just wanted more of whatever the clan had to deliver. So from a consumer perspective, if you're looking for part two to that, then you might be partially satisfied and partially disappointed because it is not part two to the Wu-Tang Clan. Now, those of us who were true fans wanted to hear the different flavors from everyone because as they describe themselves, they're like Voltron. You want to see the yellow break apart from the blue and see what they can do on their own before they all form back together and make this big mechazord, right? And then you're thinking of it as what the Wu-Tang calls chambers. You want to explore Method Man's chamber and get a feel for what he brings. If we're thinking of Wu-Tang, any dramatic deviation 
would have been too much. Uh, you, you didn't want an album full of songs like All I Need, because that would have been like, what is this? But it's dark and maybe darker than people expected because of how catchy Met The Man was on those Wu-Tang group songs. If we look back on this album, this is the the mold that Meth had fought really hard throughout the 90s to build his career around. He really made it a point to maintain the image of grittiness. The very first video from this album is him flipping his eyeball up just to show you. <laughs> A, I, I might make the catchy hooks, but I'm as grimy as the next member. That's what it is. The doubling down on the dark, gritty, grimy, dusty, didn't uh, feel like a, a, a letdown. Um, from an industry standpoint, I'm surprised Def Jam let him get away with not having as many possible singles as he could have, which again, I feel he benefits from because he's the first one out. If Old Dirty's album came out first, there would have been way more pressure to have more traditional sounding singles on this album. But coming off the success of 36 Chambers, which didn't have any of those traditional radio sounds and broke all the rules and became a massive hit and took over, Meth was free to kind of do what he wanted to do with the dark and eerie because people were like, hey, this Wu-Tang stuff works. You know, the album catches flack for being considered unfocused I think you get that feeling. There's not much talked about on here. We'll, we'll get into that. And the saving grace is that it's kept short. So you get to savor it as just this introduction to Met the Man's Chamber, the Wu-Tang. There's a uh, spacey quality because this is a very drug induced type of situation happening. As druggy as it is, it's not a pothead album or, or telling you to do drugs. You know, he refers to Takao and you know, I've read in spaces that the acronym is taking into consideration all lives. You know, Wu Tang are gonna come up with all kinds of acronyms after the fact or to couple it, but those in the know understood that Takao was one of the many slang terms for the mixture of weed and other substances that the Wu Tang were popularly indulging in at the time, whether it was spoken or unspoken. To Cal, you might also hear it called Illy on the album. Um, you can decide what you thought that mixture was, whether it was PCP or acid or crack cocaine. Uh, I do think Method Man is going on record saying it was dust, uh, which is the slang for PCP. The first song to Cal, Method Man said he was heavily dusted. You could believe the same thing for a song like Sub Crazy. <laughs> I don't think it, there's nothing on this album that says it's about taking into consideration all lives. This album is about Method Man spitting. Um, but again, as, as much as that drug thing looms, it, it was never really put in the forefront. It's not like Cypress Hill where they were making that their whole personality um, and their whole shtick. It's not about the violence. It's not about all the woo. It, it might be most more about Staten Island and Met the Men's crew than anything else because he's repping PLO style and these other subsets and people who you haven't heard shouted out on the Wu-Tang group album yet. But all of that is something to consider on a scale from one to five heartbeats when you're thinking about the intentional mood and tone on this album that takes us to Dimension 4. The song distinction versus the repetition of words and sounds. So I already mentioned that as many different sonic notes are, are being hit here, as many different uh, elements are being utilized, there's still a similarity in the feel of these beats, right? Takal and Sub Crazy don't sound the same. They're close in tempo, don't use the same instruments, but have that same feeling of the slow dragon. I'm kind of zonked out my mind, follow me as I just recite and kind of float but yeah if there's any repetition if there's any redundancy in the production it's not because the same sounds are being used maybe some of the same drum patterns some of the same drum elements kicks snares but not because of the beats themselves just the feeling of it being stripped down unfinished murky 
that over time after you get through seven songs might start to feel like okay this is just what this album is going to feel like now word wise meth has been accused of just kind of recycling phraseology um i read somewhere also that a lot of the lines on this album were phrases that he used on the, the group debut not really catching that i know meth and man throughout the 90s had his go-to lines he's one of those rappers who develop catchphrases and he knows that you know that so he's comfortable using it but met them will also tell you that a lot of the rhymes here are from years prior he might be busting rhymes from 92 91 mixed in with newer stuff some of the rhymes got lost in the flood too so those are being recreated some of those rhymes he wrote to different beats and he's doing his best to marry them with the newer feel so I think more than anything, you're going to hear intentional branding when it comes to repetition, not lazy writing. So he's going to say to Cal because that's the name of the album. And he's also calling himself to Cal, <laughs> uh, a distinction that not a lot of people caught on to when the album first dropped. You learn, you know, maybe a year or two later that he calls himself to Cal, met the Cal, the Takalian Stallion. And now he has a whole brand name after to Cal. So he put that out there naturally he's going to say wu-tang naturally he's going to shout out the projects that he's from you're going to hear kill hill park hill a lot in in staten island and, and shaolin and the slang for that you're going to hear god body talk 49311 stand out <laughs> power you but i don't know i think met the man makes enough references that he's not getting caught up in saying the same thing now as you talking about the same type of stuff that's not up for debate. This album is just raps. So yeah, both of those things, the beats and the rhymes, are things to consider on a scale from one to five heartbeats when thinking about the repetition factor and the song distinction on this album. Takes us to dimension five, the amount of content versus the amount of songs. I mentioned this is a 13 song album. It starts right off with the song. You might get the Kung Fu movie intro from the Tigers of Kwang Tung or the Master Killer movie, but it goes right into the title track and there are no skits. Um, the closest you get is Method Man doing talking at the end of songs. He does a rendition of Torture at the end to Bring the Pain, but he only does that for like, you know, all of 30 seconds. So, so really straightforward album. And in that, you're only getting any glimmers of substance on two songs that is going to be all i need to get by where he's talking about relationships his relationship in particular the story is apparently rizzo was working on that beat met the man was on tour they were living in san francisco while recording and, and moving around and he had been separated from his then girlfriend now wife uh and flew her in because he wanted her near him and he was happy. He wrote that song, dedicated it to her, and that set the stage for one of the most classic rap songs of all time. And then Stimulation. Within Stimulation, it may seem like a formless song that goes everywhere and it's just more braggadocio, but the majority of what he's saying is about trying to overcome situations and be better. He's like, study your lessons. Now he says, study your lessons on what the blood clot but on here it's more like i'm advising y'all you'll you'll be better in the end if you do that here's the movement that wu-tang is trying to spread you know we don't die we just multiply let's rise above it feels like he knows that that's the, the last song on the album he's taking it home with food for thought now the official last song on the album is the method man remix but that's just to round it out with a ribbon and, and tie a pretty bow to give you some familiarity at the end. Beyond that, every other song is braggadocio. Two out of 13, I think we would be harsher on most albums. Again, I'm biased. I feel like that's fine on this one. I don't know why it works, uh, but that is up to you to consider on a scale from one to five heartbeats if you feel like that is too low of a ratio and that affects it negatively. Takes us to dimension six, the features. All right, being the first means that you are setting the tone for what fans can expect. We had never seen a super group that we only know as a group splinter off into solo acts consecutively. 
for a whole decade <laughs> to follow. Like we just hadn't seen that. So we didn't know what to expect. Maybe a solo is just a solo. The closest we had come to that is new edition when Bobby Brown left. You didn't expect to see Ralph Tresvant and Ricky Bell and Ronnie and Mike on the Bobby Brown solo. This is Bobby Brown's album. It's his chance to shine. Uh, now when Ralph goes and does his solo, he does songs like Stone Cold Gentleman where Bobby Brown's in the video with him. Very cool stuff. <laughs> but it's it's still unprecedented for hip hop. So you don't know. I don't know if fans had enough of a setting for expectation. Maybe you're thinking, all right, this is Meth the Myth solo. It's nothing but Meth. You don't expect that every other member is going to be on every other song. Um, and so on this album, you wind up getting three core Wu-Tang members. You get Raekwon the Chef on Meth vs. Chef. You get Inspector Deck and the RZA on Mr. Sandman. But you also get introduced to Meth the Man's crew. And most of the times it feels like Meth the Man is bringing them on with him. So you have Carlton Fisk and Street Life, who I have to admit, <laughs> for the life of me, I, I struggle to differentiate and separate because on the two songs where Carlton Fisk is credited, he says the word street life on each of his verses. And it's like, bruh, are you Carlton Fisk or are you street life? They sound very similar. Street life has just a little bit more projection in how he comes off. And throughout the years, we've gotten to know street life more. I think Carlton Fisk is uh, one of the best verses on the album, in my opinion. His verse on Mr. Sandman is crazy, and his back and forth game with Method Man is top notch on PLO style. Street Life appears twice. He's on Mr. Sandman with a verse, and he's also helping Method Man on the hook with All I Need to Get By the original version. So I mentioned Blue Raspberry, Wu Tang's secret weapon when it comes to vocals around the first wave Wu Tang era. That woman belts <laughs> at least two or three tracks doing the backgrounds or the main hook and if you want to count met the man's boy booster who does the interpolation of the ninja man song uh don't test the high power where he's like and the champion come test me me have a lick out the brain yeah look it up classic dance hall ninja man and so those are your features uh there's a couple of meth's homies wu-tang affiliates who talk on the background of songs lounge low but that's it that is the extent of features on this album i think it is not up for debate i think everybody unanimously agrees that in the song meth versus chef even though it's friendly competition is not this real heated battle um meth clearly won <laughs> i would love to see in the comments if there's anyone who thinks that raekwon won on Meth versus Chef. Because if we were thinking about what battle rap looks like in the modern era, that would be the equivalent to choking what he did on Wax. I'm surprised that Raekwon even kept that verse in there. I don't know if that was Riz's decision, the way it was laid down, where he like loses his foot in and he's like, tack, it's like chest move, chest move, the board, tack, tack. And then like gets his bearing and then starts that part over to finish the verse and he still doesn't finish it strongly. He's like, yeah, now you're slayed. Meanwhile, Method Man ends his verse with straight up fighting words. Unless you think that Raekwon actually finished his verse and then came back and added a few more bars just like extra, then then you might have something which might explain how it ended. It's like, oh shit. So fun times. We don't see that again from a Wu-Tang project. This idea of these setups, which I think young fans, when we were kids, we were like, ooh, what about this member versus that member? It would be cool to see that kind of continue. I'd like to see other members try to do that. But the fact that it hasn't been touched, it makes this special, that Meth versus Chef. Um, but yeah, but beyond that, it's up to you to determine on a scale from one to five heartbeats, whether the features on this album help it or hurt it. Did you want to see more members on this album? Was it just enough? Something to consider. All right, Dementia 7, the question of do the weakest songs or does the weakest song on the album bring it down? Well, this being the most subjective dimension of the whole scale, it is up to you to determine if there are songs that are weaker than others. If you consider this album to be 
completely weak in general, I guess one song being weaker than the other doesn't really matter. Now, if you just happen to have songs that you skip, that's another thing. If you don't like the members that were featured on this album, if you don't like the members of Method Man's crew that you weren't as familiar with, um, if you don't like Blue Raspberry singing, and if you don't like certain beats, then that's certainly going to be a determinant factor. A lot of people don't like the original version of All I Need to Get By. They skip it. Sub Crazy, again, I've heard a lot of negative feedback about that song. So it's whatever floats your boat when it comes to this album. But the question is, does the weakest song or do the weakest songs take away, bring it down, lower the rating? That takes us to Dimension 8, Mass Appeal. All right, so we talked about Method Man making a key effort throughout the 90s to make sure that he was not lumped in with anything that can mistake him for a pretty boy, commercial, R&B leaning, deviant from the griminess <laughs> that made him famous in the first place. It, it reminds me of Tash when I had Tash on here to talk about the Alcoholics album Liquidation. Tash had sounded like he devoted a lot of energy on that album towards taking shots at pretty boy rappers to make sure that he wasn't mistaken for one, I think, because Tash easily could be lumped in there if they made too many commercial songs and he'd be singled out for that. And so with Meth going against type, but still succeeding, uh, I don't know if it's a testament to this album as a body of work, as much as it is how the singles were rolled out. So Bring the Pain is back in the day what would be considered the street single. The, the B-side on that is PLO style, which is another gritty, grimy song. So that is only fueling positive reinforcement because it's what people want following Wu-Tang. Remember, coming from 36 Chambers album, no one knows that there's an all I need to get by possible. We know this group for, you know, really grimy, chanty songs that didn't compromise. It didn't have any R&B element to it. You don't know what to think of next. You're hoping for a release your Delph kind of song because you want something a little bit more energetic that you can party to the same way that you could party to Method Man. Bring the Pain is recitation. Is it real, son? Is it really real, son? Something you can vibe with in your headphones or in your car, but you need something a little bit more anthemic. According to Method Man, RZA wanted the second single to be Release Your Delph. Def Jam wanted the second single to be All I Need to Get By, but remixed. The Def Jam brass came up with this idea of Mary J. To get to Mary J, you have to go through Puff at the time. And this is the blending of two emerging star worlds coming together. Because as you've heard me mention on this channel, if you've been watching, 1994, the three biggest rappers were Biggie, Snoop, Method Man. Finding a way to match a Wu-Tang member up with a bad boy feel was unthought of, unorthodox, but working so well from a business standpoint. And so there's this idea that the man said that RZA really didn't want the Wu-Tang members working with other rappers at the time. Met the man, of course, winds up being the biggest rule breaker. For those of you who watched the Ready to Die episode, he works with Biggie on Biggie's debut album. Then he works with Puff, which is the first outside producer uh, Wu-Tang members working with. And they get this remix, which gives us, like I said, the warmer radio friendly version of All I Need, that remix. Same time RZA comes with the Raise the Sharp remix because he still wants to use the Mary J combination. So Method Man said he recorded so many versions and they all came out different. There's a different break in um, the Puff version. There's a different breakdown and refrain on the Razor Sharp version. And of course the original LP version sounds different. It's just like the One More Chance song when we talked about Ready to Die. So uh, from that, and from that alone, because that winds up being the third single off the album and Met The Man was resistant and reluctant to do either of the second and third singles. He didn't really want to do Release Your Delph as number two. And he says he didn't like the video and he didn't really want to do All I Need but by the time he does it, he sees the vision, he understands, and he's still able to take ownership into how that's perceived. The video is famous because it depicts this imagery that we hadn't seen before. This man 
running to the store to get his girl a box of tampons or pads for a period, but being chased by the cops at the same time. So it's that perfect blending of I'm still gritty, grimy from the streets. He's hopping over fences. You know, he's on the rooftop. He's flipping his eyeball again. His cornrows are half done. It's unfinished. And he's letting you know, I'm not a pretty boy, but this is how loyal and down for my woman I am. I'm willing to do this, even if it means I get arrested on the way. All of that sells the story, sells the image. Girls in middle school were like, oh, I just love that. That's that sensitive thug aesthetic that uh, so many women raised in the hip hop generation and culture gravitate towards, right? It's why to this day, Tupac in the suit is the sought after <laughs> image. Yeah, so all of that, that really seals the deal. I can't express how much Relisio Delph was an important cog in that wheel. It was necessary because neither All I Need or Bring the Pain were originally up-tempo. They were mid-tempo. I do think the Puffy and RZA remixes make them more club ready and then Relisha Delph was always club ready. And so us as kids singing the hook to that, which we had no business because three of the words couldn't even be said on the radio. So shout out to Blue Raspberry for <laughs> making those expletive sound pretty. Monster songs for the 90s. And nothing about this album would lead you to believe that it had that potential but beyond the charisma and the actual image of who Met The Man is and some of that leftover high from the Wu-Tang album. Like anything from following that group album would have been big. You God's album could have came out right afterwards and it might have been almost, if not, as successful. But what winds up happening is all I need to get by exceeds everyone's expectations and makes this album beyond platinum, multi-platinum, off the strength of how it had to be pressed up afterwards. So we have deluxe versions of this album that have like five remixes of All I Need to Get By. <laughs> and it goes on to win a Grammy. Met the Man starts making solo appearances in other spaces and showing up in other media off the strength of showing that he now has entered this world that no one knew Wu-Tang could enter a year before. And now precedent is set, which ironically, no other member follows until two years later when Ghostface becomes the next rapper to kind of rap sensitively about relationship dynamics. Videos matter here. Met the man on that bus and met the man running from the cops. That's all you need. When I think about what other songs from this album could have had a life as a single, that's where the struggle begins. Stimulation might have been lucky number four. Apparently the album didn't need a number four. So something to consider on a scale from one to five heartbeats takes us to my favorite dimension, dimension nine to three eyes, impact, innovation, influence. All right, so the impact of this album is that it sets the stage for all other solo releases from the Wu-Tang. It sets a high marker because of the sales. Met the Men said Old Dirty's album was slated to go before his. He had his deal before he had his. But as fate would have it, Met the Man is first out the gate. Met the Man had a solo song off of the first album. From an observer's perspective, it makes sense that he would lead things off. And sonically, the other albums were able to build off wanting more than what Met the Man delivered because he was the victim of beats and music and recordings being lost. So it's like, no, let's really put this together. So I do think the other albums wind up having more cohesiveness because they learned from Method Man's mistake or the mistakes on the making of this album. It continues the Wu-Tang legend. It, it continues the Wu-Tang fame. It continues the Wu-Tang sentiment, the fever pitch of being fans of this group. And it puts Method Man in that conversation of that big three for 1994 because the singles were so strong. No one cares about the mixed reviews of the album when the singles were monster hits in their own right. Now, as far as innovation, I do think Met The Man gave us one thing. And, you know, you've heard me mention this when I talk about the early 90s being a time where this was prevalent, this style of uh, 
pop culture referencing and jingle remixing. Snoop was doing it. Grand Poover was doing it. Common was doing it. And even Biggie was doing it. But I do think Met The Man and Snoop were two of the first ones that did it in a way where it didn't seem campy, corny, or distracting. Because when Biggie and Grand Poover would do it, they would just break out and go sing. They would drop the beat. They would really emphasize it. Or an example I always use from Common, where he's like, I am about to explore. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> going into these animated spaces. Method Man would get animated while keeping his cool. Same thing Snoop would do. So Method Man is singing songs from like Schoolhouse Rock episodes and even doing like little little kid chants. Yo mama don't wear no drawers. I saw when she took them off and making it cool. And, and a lot of it has to do with the way the voice is used and the way it's delivered. We'll talk about that uh, at a future date. But being able to do that at a time we had marked that closing of that being done as much as probably the last year where that was a go-to style for rappers. Rappers have started moving away from it. We we're about to enter the mafioso Macadocious era where it wasn't time for all of these references. Met the man found a way to take it out gracefully, making it cool. Um, that's about the extent of innovation here. Unless you consider some of that experimental production to be innovative. And then lastly, influence. I don't know who's influenced from this album. Again, there are a lot of stoner rappers that came after the fact, but I don't think anyone considers this a stoner album uh, because Met The Man is not making that a focal point. It's like the cloud over the album, but not, hey kids, do what I'm doing. It's like, hey, this is what I'm on right now, but this is about me spitting and you can't hang with my spitting. I'm certainly influenced. This album, uh, shoot man, I used to play this album on tape every day before school, working out to it. I can recite this album frontwards and backwards, even when there's lines that I didn't understand and I'm still catching to this day. Uh, so I was personally influenced by it because it just kind of blew my mind how important personality and charisma are. Because again, using your voice as an instrument helps fill out less complete beats. And that charisma is the factor that is going to carry someone beyond track two. So all these things are something to consider when you're thinking about the three eyes, impact, innovation, and influence on a scale from one to five heartbeats. That takes us to the final dimension, dimension 10, the overall timelessness and uniqueness of this album. All right. In the pantheon of classic albums, where does this sit? I started off this episode by pointing out that many people do not consider this to be a classic album, especially when they're comparing it to other classics that came out in 1994, other classics that came out in the 90s, and certainly other Wu-Tang solo albums. It's up to you if you think any of the beats on here are dated. Uh, the Wu-Tang sound itself might be dated to a lot of people. Uh, I know if I play this for <laughs> certain people right now, it might be too weird for them. And I, I totally understand all the different viewpoints. So I would love to hear in the comments if you guys feel like this album has stood the test of time. Is it special and unique because it was so weird sounding and eerie? Or was it just lost in the sauce to its own uh, machinations of having to be pieced together? And it's just one of those things you either like because you like Method Man or you don't. Can these songs last? Uh, I certainly can attest to both of the remix versions of All I Need to Get By being hip hop songs that I don't think will ever die. Women have kept that song alive. Men have kept that song alive. DJs keep that song alive. It is a song that still has not been rivaled besides maybe Dilemma by Nelly and Kelly uh, that has as much instant notoriety and, and success. So... If you guys think of something else that's on that level, cool. I can still play Release Your Delph. I think Bring the Pain is another song that's lived on. All right. Something to consider on a scale from one to five heartbeats. And with that, we conclude the category one review and analysis of the classic debut album by Met The Man, which is now 30 years old to Cal. Man, I know I had to break out the killer bee colors. 
Not only do I have the gold, I got the black and yellow going on. Y'all see what I'm doing here? Shout out to Method Man. Shout out to y'all. Keep rocking with the channel. Tell a friend to tell a friend. And y'all already know what it is. Until next time. F a rap critic. They talk about it while I live it. Word to math.